very
Good morning. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Dr. Holly Norwick, and I am delighted to be worshiping with you this morning. We have just a couple of announcements before we begin today. Does anyone want to come up and say what that might be? Good morning. My name is Steve Nyrick, and I would like to thank Dan and his confirmation student, Jacoby, for volunteering to be today's greeters. The last two Sundays in February and most of March is your opportunity to be that person to greet our church family and people visiting KCC. Maybe this poem will inspire you to sign up today in person or through the Sign Up Genius link in the bulletin or trumpet. It should be noted, I'm not very good at writing poems. Please sign up today to be a greeter. It's lots of fun. It couldn't be neater. <laughs> you can be that person to say hello you might share a laugh or a hearty bellow. <laughs> I'll write your name down on my clipboard. I'll pray these slots are filled, dear Lord. <laughs> Again, representing the uh, Safety and Security Committee, that we've just our team that we've just formed here at KCC. Uh, just want to touch base on our new locking policy for the doors. Uh, for the last year or two, we've been locking the periphery doors uh, about 10 minutes into the service and leaving the main entry open. Um, by recommendation of the local law enforcement people, we are now locking the main sanctuary door as well, 10 minutes into the service. There is a uh, trustee of the day who stays out in the narthex and watches for people to come to it. Uh, so you aren't gonna get locked out, uh, but you do, will have to be noticed by the whoever the trustee of the day is that's at that point. So all of the doors get locked in the whole facility about 10 minutes into the service at this point. And we do want to lock them back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, uh, Scott says we promise we'll lock them, uh, unlock them afterwards. And <laughs> Good morning. So you're here for a very exciting Sunday because at coffee hour today we are having a chili cook-off. We have 10 people, contestants, who have brought in their chili to find out who has the best chili at KCC for the 2024 season. So I hope that you'll join us in the parish hall. Uh, there's a whole system set up. You'll get a little sample cup. We have trays, so you move right along. You get a little sample cup of each chili. You can bring it back to your table, sit down. We have scorecards. You do not have to use this scorecard. It's just a way to help you keep track of which chili you're liking the best. So you can, you can use whatever method works for you, but here's a way to kind of help you keep track of the chilies. And attached to the scorecard is a voting ballot. It's stapled on down at the bottom when you've figured out what your favorite chili is, then you're gonna mark the number. Each cup has a number on it. You're gonna mark the number of that cup on the voting ballot and return it to a bucket that looks like this that's in the parish hall. Now this bucket is a little different. Uh, this bucket's going to be right by the entrance door. It says chili cook-off free will offering. There's no obligation to put any money in this bucket, but whatever we do collect today will pay down the parish hall mortgage principal. So if you want to donate to paying that down, everything that we collect today will go to paying down the principal on our mortgage for the parish hall. So um, I hope that you can stay and participate by helping us vote for your favorite chili. Today is communion, as you can see, and so the children who would like to go to Sunday school will be leaving during our first hymn, and we will be coming back into the sanctuary for communion. Thank you. And now let us open our minds and our hearts for worship through music. 
Today's song of invocation is called Here I Am to Worship. Our choir is going to sing it for us first, and then we will sing it with them, the first verse, second time around. speaking. We listen to God's words and look for God's vision. Be still and know. Be courageous and brave. For God is doing a new thing right here, right now, with me. In a changing world, we gather to give witness to the power of the Spirit's presence in our lives. May this be a time to affirm that life is a gift from God. In a changing world, we hear God calling us anew to follow Jesus with purpose and passion. <coughs> May this be a time of challenge to open our ears, hearts, and lives to the spirit of life which makes all things new. Please pray with me. Persistent God, in disbelief, we thank you for never giving up on us. No matter how often we ignore you, and turn away from your word, you call after us with love and mercy. When we don't like what you might be saying to us, you encourage us with love and understanding. Every time we question or doubt you, you reach out to us with warmth and mercy. Abide with us, we pray, despite all our shortcomings and open our hearts to hear your word. Amen. I encourage you to rise in body or in spirit. Join me in our first hymn. You'll find it on page 254.
Here I am, Lord, to serve you in whatever way I can, whether it be through time, talents, or financially. Count me in as one of your servants. The morning offering will now be received. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you in so many ways. Help us to use our gifts to serve you to the best of our ability. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading is found in the first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. And you can find it on page 243 in your new pew Bible. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at, as at the times, other times, Samuel. Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it about it tingle. Here ends the reading. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 16, Verses 12 to 15, and you can find it in the Old Testament section of your Bible on page 110. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will say only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what will be made known to you. All that belongs to God is mine. That is why I said that you will receive a spirit from me, and the spirit will make all known. Here ends the reading. Please sing with me. I'm sorry. The spirit of the living God was not printed. Do you know it? Do you know it? Hold on, wait for I am sorry. <laughs> sermon, and I hope it helps open us up a little bit too. Last week, we were truly blessed by our confirmants who led us in a meaningful worship about being called by God. They shared a little bit of themselves with us and then created a moment so that we could share a little bit of ourselves too. I bet they had, they had never imagined at the beginning of their journeys that they would all be doing that last week. It taught them that, get, that giving God even a little bit of trust and room, God can bring about growth, opportunity, and ministry in ways we could have never conceived. And friends, I don't think God is anywhere near done with what God is in store for the future of those amazing confirmants. Further, 
I don't think God is anywhere near done teaching those exact same lessons to this amazing congregation as a whole either. You see, the message that they delivered was not just a confirmation assignment. They were sharing God's word with us, much in the same way that I try to do each week, the way that I will strive to do today. This message of call is not just for youth. It is for all of us. It is a call that we must all ponder both in the moment and also what might be next. I think it is now more important than ever that our diligence be intact, that our senses be heightened, and that we must remember to whom much is given, much is required. So what is God's call to each of us in this moment? Who is God calling each of us to be in our lives? Who is God calling this church to be right here and right now? What is God calling us to move towards in the future? These are all great questions, but I really have just one question for you this morning. Can we listen to the answer to them? Today we're going to take another look at the story of the calling of Samuel, which if you remember, were the confirmands were using that same message as well. Samuel was known by reputation as the greatest judge in Israel and started auspiciously at the moment of his birth. Samuel was one of those Bible miracle babies, conceived years after his mom thought that she would never conceive. So I guess it's fair to say that Samuel's journey started with his mom, Hannah. Hannah, who prayed and wept over and over again for a son once conceived, promised God that she would dedicate her boy to God's service. And so when Samuel was finally born, Hannah brought her to the temple. She sent her son off to Shiloh and entrusted his care to Eli, an aging priest who lived in the temple. In turn, Eli kept up his part of the bargain by enlisting Samuel to help around the temple, doing various odd jobs while he was young. Back in those days, the city of Shiloh, where Eli lived, was infamous for its seedy underbelly. It is a kind of city where you would walk into the temple and squeeze your wallet tightly in between your hands while you were praying. Ironically, part of Shiloh's character was because of the exploits of Eli, Eli's own two sons. If someone would walk into the temple and offer sacrificial meat, for example, Eli's two sons would pull it right out of the ceremonial bowl and eat it. As a result, over time, Eli's sons grew, grew to live off of the sacrifices of others, stealing from the temple and then justifying it because their daddy was the priest. In today's world, we would call Eli's sons privilege in the worst sense of the word. Things reached a low point with Eli's sons grew tired of eating boiled meat and they started strong-arming people for the meat before it was even cooked so they could bring it to their personal chefs and make it the way that they liked it. When word of his son's behavior got back to Eli, he was horrified and embarrassed, but instead of confronting his offspring, he let his behavior slide in hopes that it would improve over time and maturity. But for years, Eli's way of coping with his sons was effectively to do nothing. And now by the time we meet Eli in the story, he's described as an old man who has lost most of his eyesight and spent night and day largely confined to the bed in the temple where he lived. By this point, he had minimal focus, no energy left, or motivation to do much of anything except try his best to hold the status quo. To be sure, the Bible is filled with people who have lots of courage and charisma and drive, but not Eli. In his old age, Eli became complacent and overwhelmed. He was tired and worn out and unwilling to stand up for what was right, even with his own boys. As today's scripture lesson put it, though, 
The word of the God, uh, the word of God was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. Overall, these were bleak and dreary days in the Bible, and Eli's sympathy, apathy was a prime example of culture where many were passive and had simply thrown in the towel. Then, one night, Eli and his two older boys and Samuel were all asleep in the temple. As keepers of the temple, this is where they would sleep, and this is where Samuel was commissioned to serve God by caring for the details of the temple. The dawn was still a few hours away, yet according to the scripture, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. I love this phrase at the beginning of this story. Talk about the kind of devotional phrase one could repeat to oneself as a daily reminder. The lamp of God has not yet gone out. Yes, the city of Shiloh seemed awash, but there was still a light in that temple. There is still a light in our temples too. The people were tired and resting, but there was still a lamp burning. God's light meant there was a flicker of hope. There was still work to be done. There was still ministry to come. What's more, this story helps us remember sometimes it's precisely those moments when humans stop talking to God that God needs us to listen the most. Why God chose to break a long, dreary, 400-year widespread silence by talking to a boy in his pajamas is something you and I will never know. There is often no accounting for why God does what God does. And there's certainly no obvious reason why God would call out a child in this story. The only thing we do know to be true is when God calls, God wants us to listen. Samuel, Samuel. Being fast asleep, Samuel had no idea who was calling him. On the other hand, Samuel was also accustomed to being called even in the wee hours of the night, such as the life of an apprentice, you see. When someone calls and wants something, you answer. Logically, Samuel jumped up, assuming Eli had called him, and he ran in there only to be met with a very confused Eli. I didn't call you. Go back and lie down, said Eli. This happened two more times, but on the third time, Samuel came to Eli's room. It was different. Eli might have lost something on his fastball, but the third time around, he knew enough to trust God was speaking. And lo and behold, Eli woke up and mustered up enough energy and wisdom to teach Samuel how to respond to God. The words Eli taught Samuel were in many ways the boldest thing a human being could ever say in response to God's call. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And when Samuel said those words to God, God spoke back. It turns out God had some pretty harsh words to say to Samuel about Eli's indifference and what was going on in the world. God told Samuel things were about to change in the city of Shiloh. Actually, God was getting ready to change the mindset and the culture across all of Israel. God said what was to come would make the ears of all who heard it tingle. What wonderful imagery. I love it because most of us get to decide what it means to have our ears tingle. Some of us would think that our ears tingling might be exciting. Some of us might think our ears tingling might make us anxious. But all of us know that something is coming. And it all started in the middle of the night because Samuel paid attention. Thousands of years later, we find ourselves in the same kind of place Samuel did long ago. It started Last week, with our compromands cracking open the question, who is God calling me to be? It is not lost on me that this very question was first given to our youth, much the way it happened with Samuel. It is our youth who can be more genuinely, who can more genuinely see the question and listen for God's answers. Because as we learned a few weeks ago, their sense of sight and vision does not have the layers upon layers of filters and lenses that we acquire over time. 
and experience. It is they who have the ability to see and to listen a bit more authentically than some of us whose programming might get in the way. But that does not mean we aren't able to do it. In fact, each of us can experience tingling ears at the sound of movement or the voice of God. In fact, I think we have become a little bit like Eli in this story than anything else. Sometimes we let go of the passion that we can have. Sometimes the state of the world is so overwhelming, we throw up our hands, exasperated that we can't seem to do anything to move right, wrong to right, or, or love to hate, wrong, hate to love. And we let our eyes dim, and we stay close to where we are comfortable. Wondering what God has in store, or what God is calling us to do here at KCC, those are questions we don't always ask ourselves because we find ourselves depleting our energies into what we think we need to finish now. This is more than enough, what we're doing right now. But if you stop and think about it, is that ever how God worked? Do you know any Bible stories where God is waiting till all has been settled? that everyone is nice and rested, your calendars are clear, ready for the new thing? If so, let me know. I haven't found that one yet. <laughs> Friends, God is always beckoning us into a future slightly different than the way we got to this one. God is always offering more light, offering more love, offering more ways to care for one another that we didn't understand before. Mostly because I think we can safely admit we might be a little scared of what God might have to say. It might look different than what we are used to. We will all evolve along with the world the way God's word was intended to do. And we can move along this eternal love captured in the words of the scriptures and listen. Listen to God. Allow God not just to change the world, but change us and our minds too. We don't know what the future holds or what the church is going to look like or the universal church is going to look like in 10 or 20 or 30 years. We don't know down the road how we will all engage in church as we know it today. But the one thing, the one thing that we do know is if we take a look back even into very recent past, it will not be the same as it is right now. But there is one thing I do know. Once upon a time, God came to a small boy fast asleep in the middle of the night, and God spoke a word to that child, despite the fact that the little boy appeared as if he would make any difference at all in the world. Nevertheless, the moment the boy listened and responded to God, God drew a line in the sand. God marked a beginning of a dramatic about face, and together, with those who would listen, God shaped a better, more just, less painful, more loving and affirming world around them. Right now, in this moment, there's only one thing this church, all of us, really need to do. We need to listen. God needs us to listen. And you and I need to teach each other to say, go ahead, God, speak for your servants are listening. Even if it seems like God has other things for us to do, even if some of us are feeling tired and worn out, even if this past year and a half is any indication of what God could do with so little, then let us stop, listen, and prepare for God's light in the windows of this church, in the hearts of this congregation, in you and in me, still burning, for the lamp of God has not yet gone out, and we can feel it shining in us and through us. God is not done yet, not by a long shot. And in the meantime, the good news is that we don't have to know every little thing about what is in store for us. We need to know one big, important, necessary thing. It is the most Dangerous. It is the most daring, it is the most life-changing thing any of us could ever say. 
Like Samuel, who responded in the middle of the night, wearing his pajamas, and eagerly and clarity, he said, Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. opportunity to share our joys and concerns this morning. Thursday is uh, Jean's birthday. <laughs> and I also want to announce that it's the same day of, for Corey Humes. Her birthday was on this. <laughs> Who? Roz Hughes, rather. <laughs> Her birthday was on the same day as Jean. Wow. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, prayers for our son, Mark, who will be undergoing a double, his ninth double back surgery tomorrow and Wednesday. It's a joy to have Sandy back here with us today. Yay. And prayers for the owners and the employees at Kensington Market. I understand there was a fire there this weekend and they may be closed for a few days. Continued prayers for Benny Anderson and family. We've been praying for him for a little while. He's Karen Simmons' friend. Benny passed away on Saturday. We also want to lift up Don and Peggy, continuous prayers for Don recovering and Peggy's upcoming wrist surgery, as well as Dottie Fox's upcoming surgery. Um, yes? It's been brought to my attention that a number of people that watch online and some people in the congregation don't know who is offering a concern. And so the request has come to me to ask that if you're going to offer a concern or a joy, to please identify yourself at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Gates Winook, um, and asking for prayers for uh, good friends of ours, the Notarangelos. Um, Dick Notarangelo, uh, who I taught with for many, many years, um, it has been suffering from MS for, oh, I don't know, 20 plus years, and he's really gone downhill recently, and uh, just this past week has been put on hospice care, and um, I also taught with his wife, Marianne, who's like an angel on earth, she really is, she's kept him home all these years, and um, so she, it was a big decision for her to finally put him on hospice care. And um, so I'm asking prayers for uh, Dick and Marianne Notarangelo and their family. I also want to lift up David and his family. As, as some of you may have gotten the word, Miss Eleanor passed away early this week. So we want to keep David and his family in your prayers. Um, there will be a service for Eleanor this coming Friday here at the church at 1 p.m. We will be getting that information out to everyone, but they just made those decisions. Okay, so my name is Lisa Eberhardt, and I have a joy and a concern. Um, the joy was watching my son River play his senior year of basketball, and the concern is he broke his wrist on Thursday. So, um, so he's gonna have surgery uh, some point this week, and just prayers for that. Thank, Thank you. you. 
please pray with me. Loving God, we come to you today to hear your word and listen for your voice in our lives. And yet we let the noise of the world, the clanging, the distractions, the clamoring drown you out. Still us, Lord, to hear your quiet voice. Too often we are misled by our preconceived ideas of how you work and what you have to say. Awaken us, Lord, to hear your surprising voice. Stubbornly, we impose our views and plans on you, praying only with our demands and expectations. Humble us, Lord, to recognize your challenging voice. Fill us with a desire to be your faithful people, doing your will and sharing your vision. Give us today the courage to affirm the words of the prophets as we all open our hearts and say, Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. We ask this and all things in the words taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, today is a joyful day, a day where we gather around Christ's table and eat of Christ's meal. If you have not yet experienced a meal here at KCC, know that all are invited to God's table. So throughout this and all times that we approach the communion table, your seat is here waiting for us for you. So please, join us now in Holy Communion. Peace be with you. We gather around this table set before time began. We come to this table to celebrate, share, and experience God's life-giving love. Together, we celebrate the Lord's Supper and love. Holy are you, God of all creation, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Yearning for us to know you, he came to be with us. Longing for reconciliation between you and your children, he became the broken bread of life. Aching for our release from the agony of sin and death, he suffered on the cross so that we may be made whole. All this so that we could gather around this table today. And now, the table is set. The time is right. Your meal, like no other, claims us. We are called to God's table of love prepared for all people. The table of Christ is long and it has many chairs. There is plenty of room here. It is a table where love is in charge of the guest list and reservations are not required. Come, approach God's table of love, grace, and mercy. We come with open hands and open hearts. Come, just as God made you, for the gifts of grace are free. Come, for all things are ready. Please sing with me. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this as often as you eat in remembrance of me. Please sing with me.
The deacons will now come and serve you. Please wait until all who are served and we will partake together. And the words that he said to all who have come to the table the first time in every table since, take and eat. In that same way, he took the cup, looked lovingly into the faces of all who were there, and he said, This is my New Testament sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Please sing with me. until all who have been served to partake, or you can take as you receive.
And that same invitation that was ushered that first day at that first table is ushered through the ages of time. Take and drink. Please pray with me. Thanks be to you, O God, for the blessings of this table. Because of your selfless love, nations gather around one table of faith and are fed from one body and one cup. Let the peace of God and the comfort in our future with God rest our minds and our hearts. Now, nourished with grace and love, may we go forth to serve you abounding in hope, strengthened by peace, overflowing with joy and tenacious in love. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit. Join me in our final hymn, page 259 in your pew hymnal. the most daring, the best words we could say. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Join me, and blessed be the tie that binds. 